The Talk Station presents Faith Matters, a look at contemporary stories and issues from a faith perspective. While this is a pre-recorded show, we are interested in your ideas, comments, and questions, and we urge you to email them to faithmatters at thetalkstation.com. Give me faith, trust what you On the talk station, Faith Matters. And welcome to our program, Faith Matters, here on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm Ben Ball, along with Reverend Robert Cornegy, Bishop Doc Loomis, and Reverend Carl Zorowski. And and have to say that we record this program on, uh, on a Wednesday morning uh, before Sunday. So we're recording this on Wednesday after the election, uh, the historic election with a historic turnout and, uh, and also some pretty amazing results and a lot of people were uh, shocked and surprised and and full of angst about in one way or another so we want to talk a little bit about that about what to do on the day after and the days after uh coming up uh, so a uh, welcome gentlemen good to have you with us here today thank you for coming. all right let's uh let's start uh, talking a little bit about uh um some of the post-election uh readings and analysis but you know, so I had some articles that I tried to put together that, that were anticipating one way or another and how this might fall. But let's kind of just get a general reaction to to this and, and how it played in, in your own life. I know all of us are pretty interested in what goes on in politics. So first of all, I have to ask, anybody get any sleep last night? Very little. Very, very little. Very, yeah, I did. I um <laughs> Uh, you got to get to the microphone it, here. Oh, wait a minute. I'm, I'm reaching for my handkerchief. Okay, got it. <laughs> I'm good now. My holy handkerchief. i got to break that one out. So um, when uh, – this is Robert. And uh, when I uh, – when um, Pennsylvania mm-hmm. de- was determined that – I said, I'm, I'm going to Well, uh, that was – that was I was already in bed by then. Oh, come on. Yeah, were you? Yeah. I, oh, well, man. I've, I've been up since <laughs> <laughs> four, four o'clock the morning before. So uh, you should have just stayed up, done an all nighter, yeah, man. Almost, almost did. <laughs> uh, Carl, how about you? Well, I, I I found last night to be one of the most fascinating election return nights I've ever witnessed. Uh, absolutely. And um, I, I stayed up. I stayed up through the whole thing. I think I got to bed about three fifteen, three thirty mm-hmm. this morning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, how about you, uh, Doc? I am so upset right now. <laughs> oh, if you could only see his face. <laughs> I, I just, I don't know if no, I can go I'm on. I'm glad this isn't TV. <laughs> well, you know, uh, let's talk a little bit, though, about the angst that a lot of people are feeling. We, we have all commented oh, on social media. It was, on, it was on the news last night, wasn't it? It was yeah. on the TV. Yeah, you, I, I switched back and forth between <laughs> stations. I was going mm-hmm. back and forth. Mm-hmm. And it was amazing to watch the, the process Mm-hmm. The reaction of the the people, the panels that they would have, and all of that—it was just like they had no idea what was going on. Mm-hmm. And poor Chris Wallace, oh, not Wallace, what's his name? Chris Matthews, Matthews, Chris Matthews. and yeah. Rachel Maddow. Mm-hmm. That was sad. They just how would they were in know, denial until? But you know, we may go into our our churches on Sunday. And find uh, some some angst that we may find some you know over exuberance as oh, yeah. well. Uh, and how do you counsel? Where do, where do you go for that? I mean, where, where do you put uh, uh, the perspective of our faith back into their reality when you walk into a church and you see a congregation like that? What do you think, Doc? Well, we simply believe that we are neither Republicans nor Democrats or even U.S. citizens first. We're citizens of the kingdom of heaven, and our, you know, our mantra is not "Make America Great Again." It's Jesus is Lord, mm-hmm. and everything kind of starts and finishes there. And it's politics. You know, religion has become politics. Politics has become religion, and we lose sight of the simple reality that we live in a heavenly kingdom, and we have a Lord who's victorious, and the battle's already been won. And when we lose, one of the things politics in an election year like this does is it kind of sucks us into that black hole Mm -hmm. where we just, you know, we start using language like, 
you know, well, this is our last chance. This is this is it for America. It's it's apocalyptic. It's religious language, but the reality is no. I mean, Jesus was he he may have been the only one that wasn't surprised last night. <laughs> He's got this thing. I mean, he didn't sit there and have to go, really? Pennsylvania? Are you kidding me, people? <laughs> He's he's in control, man. Well, he's, know, he's got this thing, and we got to keep reminding people. The Amish, the <laughs> Amish vote is a big right. thing. That's a big <laughs> vote. All right, uh, uh, Carl, what do you think? Well, um, prior to the election, um, I wrote a newsletter article for our church that basically addressed the fact that here we are. We are in a divided nation. Um, and the politics have just divided us worse than I think I've ever I've never seen an election like this before. I hope I never see another election like this. But what I addressed in the in the newsletter we sent out was that as Christians, we can't let that sort of division come between us because we all have a commonality in that we all belong to Christ and that we as being Christians, we acknowledge that he is, the ultimate authority, regardless of who wins an election, uh, who is the king, who is the president, who is the prime minister, Jesus has all authority. And one of the things I said in the newsletter, I said as we approach the season of Advent, I'm reminded of the words of Isaiah when he said, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, prince of peace and regardless of who won the election we as christians need to remember that the ultimate authority in our lives and in the world belongs to christ because politicians make promises and politicians tend to break those promises god makes promises he doesn't break those and the psalms remind us that it's better to take refuge in the lord than to trust in humans you know, I uh, just back to your question. How do we handle it when we run into those that are that are suffering? I mean, you know, they're scared. There's fear. Mm-hmm. There, there's some people that you know. Th- this got so bitter and so accusatory, yep. and and so so demonizing each side. You know, that that's that's mm-hmm. how this stuff goes. And uh, mm-hmm. so there are people that are really afraid right now. So you know, like a like what we pastors do. What's the first thing we do is we listen. Right. We allow them to vent, express themselves <laughs> if they feel like they need to express themselves. We don't stop them from mm-hmm. doing that, and uh, we allow them to talk. And then we walk, kind of walk them through the process of trying to get back to okay, exactly what you guys have just said. The realities, you know, what are the right. what are the the uh, essentials of our faith? And then that's why we must have essentials mm-hmm. of our faith. Because they are the foundations of the building blocks of our belief system. And it's on those that we rest our cases. So whether it's the, you know, euphoria, or, you know, the, the, how did the old thing go? The uh, agony of the, the, the thrill, of victory, thrill, thrill of, victory of victory and the agony of defeat. You yes. know, here we are. You know, that's kind of a sports analogy, but it's really an analogy for life. So we're in that. And uh, so, yeah, I think w- this is a great opportunity for us as pastors and to encourage our, our members to be able to be that sounding board as well as bringing them back to the foundation. Yeah, well, what, is, what is the foundation of our faith? Well, I think you've encompassed it. But, uh, but you know, you mentioned it in the beginning, those who are feeling afraid or hurt, et cetera. Uh, but what about those who are saying, oh, my prayers were answered. I prayed all night last night for, for this result. Is, is there a theological correction to make to that? Or, or is that... Uh... We say thank you. <laughs> really? That's exactly... <clears throat> that's exactly... I would agree. Well, what we're praying is that whoever is elected rules with wisdom and justice. I mean, that's the Christian prayer for any leader. Right. Well, I think. Well, it's we a bipartisan say, prayer. Well, we say it should be. We say that, but uh, is there a theological correction that people stayed up and prayed him into office, like we mm-hmm. prayed, prayed the some, hurricane somebody off in the, the heaven coast, or? kind of thing? <laughs> yeah, I, golly, I don't know. I think, yeah, God doesn't answer prayers. I think know? prayer works. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I had, and um, as I addressed this with my church prior to the election. One of the things I emphasized was the need for prayer. 
prayer in mm. making a decision, prayer for discernment as you go forward into the voting booth. And then regardless of who wins, pray for that person. Pray for God to give them wisdom mm -hmm. um, as they as they then lead our country. Yes. Well, you know, it really is the, the primary prayer should always be for thy will be done. You know, for God's will be done, and that's I think that's where we you know we keep have to keep bringing them back. You know, that's that's the touchstone. That's the center point. Is that we're looking at, you know, our input is to be towards God's objectives and intentions, and so that means we have to kind of have an idea mm -hmm. of what his his intentions are. And, and Monday night I was with the students up at East Carolina, and we were talking about this very stuff. And I asked them, you know, what are the key issues? And everybody had different issues. One was war, one was student loans, one was abortion. You know, there were several different different positions that were important to them in this election. And, and so we went through that process of saying, okay, well, now what if you lose? What if your candidate doesn't win? And your concern is um, not you Set know, aside. Yeah, and and what what will you do then? And uh, so they they all of them went towards prayer. We will pray. Well, right around the corner from your church, uh, Carl is uh, Open Door Baptist Church, and they had uh, out on their marquee, uh, uh, "Pray and vote, vote and pray." Yep, and that's uh, that is still our mantra. We'll have uh, more to come in a moment here on Faith Matters on the Talk Station FM one hundred and seven and AM twelve forty. Welcome back to Faith Matters here on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. Thanks for uh, joining us here this morning. Again, we we're recording on a Wednesday morning, the day after the election. And so we're talking a little bit about uh, our responses there and where our responses may go with our congregation. I want to take, we talked about prayer uh, closing there. And I know I mentioned this morning that uh, my prayer is also uh, is that uh, Donald Trump will come to know God more deeply. Will he will he will call on him and he will seek that discernment not just of good people around him that we hope that he will he will have, but also of uh, of godly people and of those who might be able to minister to him, because I I do believe that even with all his crass statements that he has made and he's made things that uh, that I can, you know, could not justify saying uh, anyone saying but uh, uh could but that he will. Um, temper that and that he will come to to learn more about what god may have in store for him as well so uh you know that's that's a prayer i hope that we have but one of the things that that this remarkable election did was basically was put a populist into the presidency not a true conservative you know kind of an er, you know, erstwhile republican not to, it's hard to even peg him in any of those categories except for being he touched a nerve uh, with a lot of people who were fed up over over things. And so, Robert? Yeah, well, it was fascinating to look at the, um, you know, after election, some of the reports. They're still coming out. They're still crunching the numbers yeah, and we're whatnot. We're just hours away from it. Yeah, but I just heard that uh, there was a report this morning that there were uh, um, an additional 4 million evangelicals that voted this time than – the last presidential election, four million more voted. Now that's that's a pretty significant number. Mm -hmm. That's quite a response, and um, and but it's actually at the same percentage as the last one. It's just that there were so many more voters in all the different categories, primarily. Mm -hmm. That the, I mean, the pool was bigger, mm -hmm. so it stayed at about a twenty-six percent of evangelicals voted, but there were additional 4 million. And that 4 million was the difference, I don't know if you recall, mm -hmm. that uh, – didn't he win by 4 million, no, Obama, in, or 6 oh, million? Oh, in the popular vote. In yes. the popular vote. Yes, I think right. there was a, a 4 to 6 million. It's essentially a tie right it's, now. Right. In the popular vote, that's mm -hmm. right. But, yeah, so so there was a fascinating response from the evangelical church – or the evangelicals to toward the um, – towards this candidate and um 
you know, that's uh, that, that they're going to be analyzing that for a long time because it really did put kind of a bright line between the two worldviews mm-hmm. of the parties, which you could, you know, by going to the platforms, you can look at those worldviews that each party has. So very distinct. You know, uh, uh, Doc, in the lectionary reading from last week, it was it was a uh, uh, Persian king Darius uh, allowing uh, for uh, folks to go and rebuild the the temple, uh, and Haggai was uh, was pleading with them to to get get to it and get the work done. Uh, and a lot of people took the approach. A lot of Christians that I've talked to, and I've heard it on on our various uh, shows that we have on the station, saying that that God often uses people who are not. Uh, necessarily his followers to do his work is that a is that a, something that we are are praying that he becomes a follower but but we may acknowledge that he may have had he has a use for someone who isn't isn't necessarily a, a believer now yeah i like the darius reference i've been doing a lot of reading about the rebuilding of the temple lately and um he definitely uses people like that i I mean, in our lives, I mean, you think back, well, not in my life, I wasn't not this old yet, but um, thinking back to World War II and Winston Churchill and all of his foibles and Mm -hmm. eccentricities and everything, and you don't have a victory in World War II without him. You just really don't. And yet, here was a guy that the Lord had in the right place at the right time. And that has been kind of the way that the Lord does things, which is why I think we're told in First Timothy that we're supposed to, you know, give give reverence and and, ob- and homage to the people who are in leadership over us, because mm-hmm. it might just could be whatever we think. I mean, what was the guys in the Old Testament? You know, remember that King Dave guy? <laughs> he wasn't exactly what you call squeaky clean either. No, uh, Moses. I think I'm pretty sure he had murdered a guy just a little bit before God picked him up and used him. And I don't think that Trump has murdered anybody that we're aware of. And so, yes, I, I, Ben, you're absolutely right. This is if, if the Lord has picked this man for this time, then he knows what he's doing, and there's a, and there's a reason for it. Absolutely. The, the big thing right now, this is the thing that concerns me. And since we're going to do four segments on politics, I'd have probably gotten <laughs> to it later. But, but you know, you asked, you know, what what is the church supposed to do? And I think really the agents of reconciliation role. It's one of the things politics does is it divides people up into categories. Mm-hmm. And we talk about Hispanic votes, and we talk about did right. the blacks come out. or I'm talking about white votes. Evangelicals or, white or, or evangelicals. Right, right. So Women. politics by its very nature is ext- it's, it's like walking into a kitchen and watching a chef cut up a chicken. you know. And so I think right now what I want to do is I want to go back – and really be an agent of reconciliation, you know, toward the, glue toward the, the chicken kingdom. back together. Huh? Glue, start, I mean, that, listen, if you're a pastor and you ain't gluing chickens together right now, you're probably not doing the right thing. That's a really interesting analogy. <laughs> yes. you know? Well, I was at Chick fil A this morning and I got thinking about it. I got thinking about it. You know how it's such a wonderful place, but you don't see them actually back there cutting the no chickens. no you don't they, they that's all right that. yeah sorry carl that go ahead yeah, it is yeah that'll preach but it's a great yeah. illustration i'm gonna use that in my sermon sunday <laughs> can we work in the holy bird kind of yeah. thing on that well you, you made a reference to um first timothy and uh you know there's the passage there's the scripture in there where where this goes back to what we we're talking about earlier about praying okay and i believe that's where reconciliation begins you know, where, where Paul writes, I urge, first of all, the petitions, prayers, intercession, thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings, and all those in authority, so that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and holiness. Mm-hmm. And without our praying for those people who are in authority, we're not going to see that reconciliation. Yeah, it, it just just as you were saying that, you know, I... I um I just had had this this idea come in of um, how pervasive politics has become in our lives, mm-hmm. and particularly in our culture. I mean, it it really is like a cancer. It has spread. You can see the tentacles of it move out, and so that everything is politicized right now. Well, that's that's that whole Russell. The, the, the politics has become religion, and religion has become politics. Yeah, and that's the Russell Moore statement. Yeah, Russell that's Moore exactly statement. right. And it's it's such a it's such a trap that the enemy sets because we do begin. We are so saturated with this in our minds that we can't think of people except in categories. 
Mm-hmm. You, you know, that's how we've come to classify. You're, you know, and you're either with me, you know, you're my friend if you're with me, but you're my enemy if you're, if you're not. And that is something that the church, you know, unity and diversity and all of that, that we're able to come together as the body of Christ at all different levels of maturity, all different levels of experience, all different levels of callings, all different levels of, of um, how we operate in the world, how we view the world. And God says, you know, there mm-hmm. is no difference between you. You are all mine. Right. And that wall, of course, he was speaking, that wall of separation in Ephesians that he was speaking of, he, he breaks down those walls. And so we are not to be, politics is building walls. Um, the church is to be taking those walls down. Now, as you say, politics have all, has always been divisive and has always had that element there, even even when we could hardly tell the difference between parties. You right. know, there was still that division of a Republican family or Democrat family. Yeah, the legacy, you know, all those legacy things. votes. But now we're also seeing, uh, even within families now, and this is where the church may have to come together in some sort of counseling as well. I know within my own family, I have very, very vast differences of, uh, of opinion about politics. I've always been a, a, an observer. I always like to kind of watch the things that are going on. I always like to watch how television covers politics. You're just sort of a so, critic, aren't you, I, of the said, whole system? Yeah, I, I look at it all. But, uh, he's, he's just being very Methodist. But, uh, <laughs> yes, but I know. I know Thanksgiving dinner is coming up. Oh, yeah. And I'm and I'm going to be in a place that is going to have quite divergent views yeah. and also quite critical views of the victor here, and uh, and uh, so it's going to be a place where people have to decide: do they hold their tongue? Do they talk about this? Do they seek that reconciliation? And how do we equip? How do we equip our congregation? I mean, we talk about it as pastors, and we train for that. But uh, but how do we equip our congregation? to help find that reconciliation point, you know, while they're passing the gravy. Yeah, yeah. And that they don't, they don't throw the gravy <laughs> instead. So I think that's going to be difficult. It's going to be a difficult time in the next Look, we're, several we're, weeks. Look, we're in the middle of that constantly. I mean, you know, we, we um, I, when, when I say we, I talk about pastors right, and right. Le- leaders of, of churches. Um, and the call that we have is to be models of mm-hmm. reconciliation. I mean, we you know we have the ministry of rec- reconciliation that, mm-hmm. that we were given that by God. So that's that's kind of clear. Mm-hmm. And uh, so if so, that's being a peacemaker. That's what reconciliation is: is being a peacemaker. So we're ambassadors of peace. We're ambassadors, as you said, of the Prince of Peace. And uh, therefore, we have to we have to model this stuff in our lives and and call it into the call it into our congregations. Yeah, and and here we come into a season where we between uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, as you alluded to, also the beginning of Advent, uh, as we're anticipating uh, Christ and Christ's return and uh, Christ's birth, and so. Where do we relate that in our world that has become so divided by politics? We might want to talk about that. Coming up and more here on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. Welcome back to Faith Matters here on the Talk Station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm Ben Ball, along with the Bishop Doc Loomis, Reverend Carl Zorowski, and, and uh, Reverend Robert Cornegie, as we talk about um, the election that has just happened for us just hours ago, finishing up uh, as we record this. So we're really getting very kind of raw emotional reactions, as well as uh, some thoughts about where we attend to spiritual matters. Uh, Doc, you were telling me actually about reading an article about uh, that uh, the, I think it was Huffington Post. It was talking about what do we what do we say to the children, you yes, know? That was, and, that was the morning article. It was so precious. I was thinking about my grandkids. You know what? I'm, it, this is the article. 
What are we going to say to our children now that Donald Trump is now that the bad man yeah. has the has, has, man, gone, yeah. has gone to the White House yeah. and the, and their answer was, well, the first thing we're going to tell them is that the bad man's not going to hurt you, that we have a government that's 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 been developed by very smart people, and they're not going to let him do any of those horrible things he said he was going to do. And so the first thing you need to do is tell your children that he was just it was all a bunch of puffery and and, and nobody's going to let the bad man do this stuff. And I'm thinking about this is a real article from a well, I mean, ostensibly <laughs> real publication. Yeah, yeah. And and it's actually and it's it's primary concern is that our children are going to be devastated by this. And is, I, I look, my granddaughter's class uh, at uh, at the White Oak School did a uh, what do you call it a mock election. mock election, and so she came she came over to the house and she, I said well, she said I voted today, uh, Papa, and I said you did, who did you vote for? And she said I voted for Donald Trunk, Trunk. and I said that's good. I said who did the who did the other kids in the class vote for? She said well we all voted for Donald Trunk, so I. As a as a grandfather and a father of apparently of children, uh, <laughs> I haven't really had any of my millennial children or my whatever this new generation of grandchildren. I haven't had any of them come crawl under my bed and say, "Protect me from the bad man." I mean, his hair is freaky, right? Yeah. yeah. But I mean, other than and my kids get a kick out of that. They think that's funny. Yeah. They love his hair. Well, and and if you look at the mock elections across the country, so many of them went for uh, for Trump. Uh, so and did the little children lead us <laughs> in this regard? Uh, well, by listening to the news, it was the uneducated that led us, yeah. because you know their 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 bifurcation on this thing is college graduates voted for Hillary, right? Yeah, you know, the uneducated knuckle draggers, you know, voted for. Trump, and uh, so it's it's fascinating to see how they're they're parsing this thing. Look, these people don't give up. Yeah, it could be they are not of the education. Well, you think Democrats are going to run again? Oh uh, yeah, they're you not. Oh, I thought this was it. I thought they, we yeah, had, so I was hoping this was it, but I don't I don't think so. They they don't quit, do they? they the election uh, to end all elections. Yeah, yeah this was it, and they all woke up this morning. They said, "How could I have been so?" wrong in my thinking but of course trump is the best man for the for the country everybody sees that now yeah. and we're getting on board with this uh, yay no, that's not happening. trump that uh, you know you don't think that's going to happen no not I at don't all think so. in fact i think that the article that you're talking about is just a precursor of what we'll see for four years yeah uh, oh, and and the boogeyman and, and uh, carl i think this is one of the things that uh that is um uh i think dangerous in our society is when we see again this divisive nature uh being expressed so openly in in the in the sense that they're right and that we were all wrong or the, the, the people who voted were all wrong. Mm -hmm. and, well, we, we've, we've been talking for the last several weeks about um, how you watch the news on television now and you don't know what's real. You don't know what's, what's true. You don't know what's, what, what is somebody's opinion. You know, it's now you watch a news program and it, they, what they give you is all the news that fits their agenda. Okay. And so um, when I was watching the returns last night, what fascinated me, I think, the most was how wrong everybody had been. All the experts. I mean, we sat down at dinner last night, and I told my kids, I said, well, they said, who's going to win the election? I said, Hillary Clinton's going to win the election. And I felt very sure that Hillary Clinton was going to win the election. And the results surprised me last night when I watched it as well. And then to see these experts squirming in their seats on television because they had been so wrong I, I i've never seen anything like it but how much of this robert do you think is a is a also and a lesson for us is that when we push negatively mm -hmm. people push back and right. and i think that was the case in this election that that it, you could bring out all the bad things and there were plenty of them you could bring out about what donald trump has said or alleged to have done etc but uh, the people who were fed up just simply pushed back harder. Yeah, isn't it interesting that the uh, media in many, many aspects, and particularly the news media, has become, and we talked about it, you know, that, that journalism um, really has become editorialism. Right, right. It's changed. It used, the assumption was that 
no, the facts, ma'am, nothing but the facts. And that's what reporters reported. Mm-hmm. You're a journalist. Sure. And so you, there's a difference between editorializing and and journalism. Mm-hmm. And that's why we have a special page in the newspaper that is the editorial page. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm constantly, you don't go there for the nuts and bolts of what's going on in the community. I'm constantly rewriting the AP stories. Yeah, that because I, of no, their because editorializing. Of right. Yeah. So and it's, it's so, very subtle often. And it's true. I mean, what, what – um, um, Carl was saying about we don't know if it's if this is an editorialization or if this is a journalism. I mean, you mm-hmm. can pretty, you, you, you can spot it pretty quickly. Well, look now. at the staffs that surround both political parties. Right, they're former journalists. Well, they're, I, they're writing pieces and then submitting them to the news sources and, and saying, "Does this does this work for you?" Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and then, then the, the news sources are, if they write something, then they submit it to the political party. Well, does this work for you? Yeah, I, the point I'm making is that I believe last night and this morning is a repudiation of our media system. I agree. I believe it was a huge pushback on the media system. On the on the old guard, media. on the yeah, the what you know they call it the, the mainstream, mainstream yeah. or the legacy when, when or Fox whatever. Is number it is. one, it's hard to call that the mainstream, mainstream any longer. But so across I call it the, the old guard. board yeah. pushback, right? And um, now whether they're going to get it or not is is the question. I don't think it. I don't, well, isn't the same true is true though for people who are also so uh, elated with this? So the people that that are, that are going to gloat over this victory and they're so elated with it, you you might kind of remember that uh, that you know, heroes can fall and fall hard and fast. Uh and and there will be people out there trying to chop at those legs all the entire well, time. The next 4 years of our life is going to be summed up in the word stop Trump. Yeah, that's the, the, everything that's happening in Washington right now and in the media is going to be how do we stop Trump? That that's just get ready for it, because that's what we're going to hear for four years. We must stop him. Yeah. E- even though we we also talk about being, uh, you know, the government's on his, on his shoulders, you know, that that, that we have to uh, look at where we can where we can reconcile, but also allow people still to have their opinions yeah, uh, but their but their opinions are 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 in their proper place. I'm going to draw it not pretty personally. Tax. I'm going to draw it pretty simply that there there really is a worldview split here, and one of them is a is a faith based traditional mm-hmm. worldview that God exists and and is involved in the affairs of man. That that's a historical worldview mm-hmm. and there's a there's a new worldview a newer worldview it's not, it's old but that um god is not involved he may exist we're not sure about that but uh he's definitely not involved in the affairs of man that it's up to man to fix this it's the, the so there's the appeal god to versus god the, versus the appeal yeah. to man yeah. and we're seeing this divide and it's in our country it's it's very strong in our co- and it's 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 a powerful political tool tool and we've seen both sides played and this time you know mm-hmm. appealed to and this time it just so happens that the traditional position won out but you see how close this is this is very close and in the popular vote, mm-hmm. it's very close. So we are a divided nation. We have two dominant worldviews. I mean, there are many others, but those are the two dominant ones. And, and this, I want to just, I want to read this to you because this is from a friend of mine who lives out in Colorado. So I know she can't hear this. She's a millennial, and she wrote on Facebook, "Going to hop on the bandwagon right now." Anybody who supported Trump through this election, please remove yourself from my friend list and stay away from me. I understand you have the right to your political beliefs, but supporting Trump goes far beyond political differences today. If you still stand behind him after all that he said and done that I cannot associate with you, I'm disgusted and ashamed. And that's what's happening. That division is that division is becoming more and more clear, and it's going to, to be point, elaborated on. And, and that's why we need to be reconcilers, like you said before. And, and I believe that had the election results been different, we'd still be hearing the same thing today. Except I'd have told her to unfriend me. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, you're probably uh, right, Carl. <laughs> this is a uh, this is again this divisive nature, though it it extends beyond. Uh, well, it, uh, obviously, it's accented in politics. Uh, but are we ex- we're extending it beyond that now? I mean, we're looking at black and white divides. I think like we have never seen before. We're looking at rich and poor, elite and non-elite, educated, uneducated divides out here too. And as uh, as Christians, don't we have to try to find a, where we are in the same pew? Oh find yeah, we got to we got to we got to be all unified like the church is. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's that's a challenge. That's we don't right. model we don't model unity. In our own churches, and then we say we're going to be the agent of unity, the agent of reconciliation, and I believe that's our goal. But we don't live like kingdom people. We live like Methodists and Anglicans and Presbyterians and Lutherans and Catholics. It's just how we do it. We'll have more to come in a moment here on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. Welcome back to Faith Matters here on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm Ben Ball, along with Reverend Carl Zorowski and Bishop Doc Loomis and Reverend Robert Carnegie. And we're talking about uh, on this day after the election, just hours, really, as we record this on Wednesday, just hours after the uh, the victory was declared uh, for Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton in the uh, national election. Of course, there were there were other elections as well, too. In North Carolina, you have a divided, uh, uh, you, we've talked about division, you have a a uh, very slim lead at the moment as we speak for Cooper over McCrory for the governor's position and a uh, Supreme Court um, uh, a justice that won that, that takes a more liberal stance than the, uh, the, the other justice who uh, lost that for the North Carolina Supreme Court. But you also have uh, an attorney general. It looks like the Democrat's going to win the attorney general's position as well, too. So there's... Lieutenant it's, Governor is close. Uh, no, the Lieutenant oh, no, Governor is not. That, that no, wasn't. No, Forrest is going to win that one. It yeah. takes that one away. But I had this post the day before. Now, this was uh, the day before the election on Monday. And this is from an old friend I used to work with in radio. And he, and he writes, here's my personal belief on this election day. I'm not sure which one it will be, but we're going to have an unsavory president. Uh, there is no uh, selfless leader, no person of high moral character or integrity, no gracious and respectful candidate from which to choose. But I'm a Christian. Now, I understand that presidents come and go, nations rise and fall, people live and die, but I have a mighty and righteous king. And nothing that happens on election today changes that. I have already voted, and I think you should too, but uh, my trust is not in men. So... Uh, hope I think that one of the things that points out is that we talked about before we had an amoral election. We had we, we no one could claim really the moral banner on this. But obviously, evangelicals, as you talked about, Robert, did make a choice here. So so where did they find that they could make that? choice based on their values you think well i think a lot of evangelicals frankly and and um, this is an opinion obviously that um they voted their self-interest because they've looked at this last eight years and what 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 has been the kind of the feeling from the and, and i'm just speaking kind of my own experience i've i've sensed that there's been a, a an increasing attack on my liberties to be to live out my faith in um, my culture, mm-hmm. that there have been forces trying to limit that. The state has has started to expand to the point that it's now attacking the um, institution of the church, and we're in this sort of existential battle right now, and that. Um, one of the and and as I mentioned in the earlier segment, you know that that uh, the candidates have played to their bases, and that that therefore Trump recognized that early. He had some evangelicals brought in evangelical advisors. His mm-hmm. vice president is a solid evangelical believer, mm-hmm. and uh, there, I, I had a conversation with a with a friend the other day who uh, was talking to a leader in the evangelical movement for the last 30 years and was talking about the candidates for that he's going to recommend nominate for the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 
there has been a, a direct um, appeal to evangelicals. So I think they voted their interest. I mean, we have an interest in pushing back on this expanding mm-hmm. sense of government and state. You know, there are two different institutions that God set up. One is civil government and one is the church. He establishes both. He established both. Mm-hmm. And one is inclusive. Civil government is inclusive. Inclusive. It includes Christians. It includes everybody, atheists. It doesn't matter who you are. You're a part of civil government. You're a citizen of the state. And the church is exclusive. The students just could not handle that Monday night when I said that. What? <laughs> How can you say that the church is exclusive? I said, well, who is the church? Right, and don't we say that in our liturgy? We say <laughs> yeah, we, uh, you know, we who have our followers of Christ are mm-hmm. the church who have been born by the Spirit, mm-hmm. reborn, and we are the church of Christ. It, it's exclusive. Now, it's open, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but it's exclusive. And these two are always going to be in tension. There will always be that tension, and the so the church's role in its in the in God's big picture is to be sort of the the influence towards the kingdom. We are we are looking for the rest of the church, the bride of Christ. We're on the hunt. We're searching. So <laughs> I have a lot more I could say about yeah, that. If right. you'd like to email me at rlcornegy <laughs> at gmail dot com, I would be happy to send you uh, more information. Yeah, a, meanwhile, Doc is going to laugh for a while. I <laughs> uh, and, and Carl. So I guess that puts me. On yeah, the that spot. puts you. <laughs> <on>. <laughs> <laughs> we might be getting a little punchy by this time. Yeah, I think we're all a little tired this morning, Ben. <laughs> yeah. But but Carl, seriously though, when we when we look at uh, this new administration, and we looked at we've talked about all the tensions and all the things that can arise from that too, and we do have we still want to approach. We should, as Christians, we want to approach this with hope, grace, mercy, <laughs> some other all, all, stuff, all of right. these that's fruit right. of the spirit, and and I. I you know, I keep coming back to what we've talked about earlier today. We need to approach it in prayer. We need to acknowledge that God is in control. Regardless of who wins an election, we as Christians believe that God is in control. And, um, you know, even, well, Robert, you were talking about the, um, you know, you got the church and then you've got the civil Right. And, authority state and or the church in the state and the state is horribly divided right now we see that last night okay regardless of what evangelicals did regardless of how atheists voted regardless mm-hmm. of how um anybody voted we see that we have a very divided state right now and we as pastors need to work on the division in the church Mm -hmm. because the church can't look like that we need to show the world what the kingdom looks like what it looks like for people to live in community with each other even when they don't share the same opinions so here we are looking at a um uh, an opportunity uh, really uh for us to to build a community yes uh, here yes to build build a community no. You know, uh, Doc, when uh, you have uh, uh, people that want to express all the divisions that uh, Donald Trump is standing for, uh, it, divisions of uh, keeping Muslims out of the country, uh, that, that you know, people claim that's what he says when he actually says uh, from Muslim, uh, from hot spots, you know, is a limited yeah. immigration or building a wall, all these other things that, that uh, do appear divisive. But he is also looking after sovereignty uh, of a, of a nation. Is that is that uh, is that exclusive of what we look at as Christians? Or? Uh, do we look at the sovereignty of nations of nations as a as a Christian? You guys keep working with me because look in this room. There's about a combined six hours of sleep last night among the four of us. Is what I'm thinking right yeah. now. 
<laughs> all I know, I mean, I'm, I'm on Facebook right now. I shouldn't be paying attention to the show, uh, but I'm on Facebook because Donald that's Trump. That's the only reason I called on you because you weren't paying attention. Well, so I invite the teacher in school. Like school that, right? Yes. <laughs> Donald right. Trump just ordered 620 million bricks from Belden Brick Company. <laughs> now, what do you think he's going to do with those? Inscribe. Mm, I think the wall is getting ready to go. Uh, Gosh, I don't know. I think that sovereignty is is all the Lord's. You know what He gives us. He, he divides up the way the world, the way He's going to do it, and we're given our part to take care of. Mm-hmm. Well, and He talks about peoples and nations and tribes and ethnic yeah. ethnic. Mm-hmm. I mean, it isn't we're we're you know He. The original division of us was over language. You remember right, that? Right, it right. wasn't. It wasn't about race. It was about language. Out of the well, actually, Tower it was, actually, of it was about sin. Well, true, but because he used, once upon a time there was one, there was one country, right? And then when we sinned, we got kicked out of it. Yeah, but he used language to separate us, and so that's how it how it went about. So, so you know, it's not unusual that we have these divisions. the The question is, as the church, can we bridge those dis- divisions? Can we find that that thing, that place of peace? Mm-hmm. That is the common ground. That's the only common ground we have. Peace and with the answer Christ. is no, because divisions are the result of sin, and we can't stop sinning. If we can stop sinning, we can start being united again. No, okay? but we, but but we, we, we can't we, stop Christ, it. We can't, we can't stop it. Right. So we can be given the power to overcome sin, to no. overcome the power of sin, and overcome those divisions. In the end, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And until then, we're going to continue to divide. And the best that we can do is love one another as Christ loved us and to, and to exemplify in our relationships with others, whether it's other churches, other races, or your grandkids. You just got to love people. If we, can get, if, if we can just convince Christian people to love people, then we've done pretty much all we can do. Yeah. It's, it sounds like one of those greatest commandment things. Right oh, there, it's right? in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it refers to it occasionally. Yeah. But the, um, you know, that that um, we can't love other people until we ha- feel the love of God first. That's the love that we love other people with. Oh. It's not something we dream up. It comes from Him. It's a gift from Him. Thanks for joining us today on Faith Matters here on the Talk Station FM one hundred seven and AM twelve forty. We'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us for Faith Matters. Email your comments, questions, and suggestions to faithmatters at thetalkstation.com. of the talk station.